Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Phil Clark. I'm the Business Development Director for Support Services. Um, and I look after all the different sectors within support services. I've been in this role for um, seven years. But today I'm just going to talk about the healthcare sector, which is one of our most exciting sectors in terms of uh, growth opportunity. So um, the way I'm going to conduct this is I'm just going to give you an overview of the healthcare market from an inter perspective, what we think is going to happen in that sector in the future, um, an overview of our strategy, and then two uh, key elements of that strategy, which is our advance in terms of non-clinical services, primarily, primarily facilities management and property, and then our new acquisition, which was Advantage, which we bought at the end of last year and allows us to go forward into the clinical services sector. So in terms of the actual uh, market, the uh, UK currently spends around £110 billion in terms of the NHS. Um, that's about a doubling over the last 10 years of expenditure, which is obviously pretty substantial. At the moment, the actual expenditure is ring-fenced from the uh, government cuts, and I think this year it had about 0.3%, 0.4% uh, increase in terms of expenditure. The Institute for Fiscal Studies uh, just uh, put a report out about a week ago, which said that if we carry on with the current demand versus the current budget, we're going to have a £29 billion gap in the next 10 years. So what we think that does, that drives a huge issue, obviously, in terms of finance, um, and requires a lot of efficiency needs to be brought into the NHS. So from our perspective, that, that presents a potential opportunity. So there are three key things we think which will actually drive further private uh, penetration into the outsourcing sector in terms of the clinical services. First thing is last year, the Health and Social Care Act. Um, there's been a lot of publicity about this. The first thing that happened was that the GPs will now be uh, a key part of the actual procurement and commissioning of services. Um, but the probably more interesting piece is Section 75, which puts an onus on the commissioners to actually test the market to look at private sector provision of services as opposed to just the NHS providing those services. Also, we've had Monitor in place for three or four years now. Monitor is the regulator of all services in the NHS. Um, and three key elements to that which we think will help drive the sector. One is um, any qualified provider. So every year the government is putting a number of services out to the private sector for competition. Um, and this year they've also introduced an NHS provider licences. This requires all government NHS bodies, as well as the private sector, to have a licence to actually operate in terms of providing clinical services into the NHS. And um, something that's been obviously going for seven or eight years now is the um, status of foundation trusts. So there are around 250 different trusts in the UK in both community and acute sectors. And by April 2014, they need to have actually... Uh, become foundation status. This gives them financial independence and the ability to go and borrow money. As it stands at the moment, only about 150 of those trusts have actually achieved foundation status. And a couple of very um, high profile incidents, such as South London Acute Trust, which is in financial difficulty, and Hinchinbrook, which was privatised about two years ago, and um, Capita Circle took over the running of that hospital. So we think there are huge changes coming in this sector driven through the, the um, Health and Social Care Act, but also in terms of regulation. Um, in terms of quality, which is obviously hugely important, particularly in the NHS in terms of um, private sector <coughs> delivering services, the CQC, the Care Quality Commission, are the people who inspect and regulate in terms of quality. Um, they're trying to put in place national standards to ensure that people are actually delivering to the quality that they should be, and there's chief inspectors who will inspect both the private sector and the NHS bodies. So we think overall that will drive around a 5 to 10% potential growth in terms of private sector penetration into the NHS services. From an incident perspective, the two real key parts of that are non-clinical services, very much our traditional markets of facilities management and property management. But with um, the acquisition of advantage, it gives us pe potential to penetrate into the community sector. So in terms of that 110 billion, broadly you can break that down into two elements. In terms of non-clinical, the NHS is currently spending around £20 billion per annum. Of that £20 billion, around £5 billion is actually through facilities management and property management. In terms of the clinical sector, the three primary um, components to that. first one is the primary uh, clinical services. That's your GPs, pharmacy um, and dentistry. Generally, that's not a sector we think will um, 
offer much opportunity for him to serve. Um, the second part is the secondary, which is your acute NHS trust, that's your big general hospitals. Current expenditure is £50 billion, pounds, a huge amount of money. Um, at the moment, that's probably where the biggest single pressure is coming in terms of budgets. And then the one that we think is the growing sector is the community sector. That's a very broad church, uh, ranging from mental health right the way through to um, quite core clinical services, such as oncology now being delivered very much into people's homes or in terms of community hospitals. We think the general movement is that the secondary sector will generally move more towards the community sector. Generally, in terms of the care that you will receive, most people will respond better to care in their own homes or in their own locality rather than being in a general acute hospital. <coughs> and also the cost. The cost to deliver care in terms of the community is on average around 50% of what it costs to deliver the same care into an acute hospital. So what does that mean to InterServe? As it stands at the moment, 2013, we think that is a potential market in the future for us of 20 billion. That's 5 billion in terms of FM and property related services and around 15 billion in terms of the community sector. So a big market for us. Um, in terms of their growth, we think in the next two years, given the changes that are coming in terms of legislation, regulation and compliance, that will grow by about 10% over the next two years. And then just drilling down a little bit further into that, what that actually means for us in terms of how much has actually already been put out to the market and that which will be competed in the next three to five years. In terms of the clinical community services, a very small percentage of that has actually been outsourced to date. So predominantly, this is delivered by NHS staff. Um, it's around 20% is currently outsourced. And when we've examined a lot of that, th those services that have been outsourced, it's very much in locally procured, single services. So there hasn't been huge swathes of outsourcing in an integrated way, a big potential opportunity. In terms of the non-clinical services, which is um, very much around the facilities management and the property management, obviously that's a much more developed market. It hasn't been core services for the NHS, so it's been a lot easier in terms of getting those outsourced. About a billion pounds of that is currently outsourced in terms of long-term outsourcing. Generally that's been done through the PFI um, procurement strategy, and also in terms of the project like at Leicester that we secured last year, which I'll talk about further shortly. Around 40% has been outsourced in terms of short-term outsourcing, which is generally on the uh, competitive tendering, one to three year type projects. Again, that will come around in terms of cycles. Every three years that will be re-procured. And then 40% is still delivered in-house, which is quite a staggering number considering the amount of competition that's been brought into the NHS. So from our point of view, we think there are huge opportunities, both in the short, medium and long term, in both parts of those two sectors. In terms of our strategy, the next one, um, we see there's two key elements, obviously. One is facilities management and property management, a £5 billion market, and the community sector through the acquisition of Advantage, which is a further £15 billion. What we think that does is gives us a broad range of service capability, so we can cut across not only the non-clinical services, but also clinical services. In terms of relationships, we, through, as InterServ, have been operating in the NHS for over 15 years. We've got very senior relationships through our PFIs and our facilities management contracts, right to the heart of the commissioning groups. With Advantage and with InterServ's history, we've got a good health market understanding. And we've got an infrastructure across the UK, so we, we can actually operate anywhere, any point in England, Scotland and Wales. Um, just to give you a bit of background on the Leicester project, which we secured last year, which is a very good example of um, non-clinical service outsourcing. It's probably the largest project let of its type in the NHS. Um, Leicester's population is around 300,000 people. So in terms of um, scale, it's less than half, half a percent of the actual NHS expenditure that's actually being spent in Leicester. It's broadly around a billion pound they spend on healthcare services per annum. Um, this project was uh, bringing together of all the different elements of the NHS in Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland. So it's um, the primary, the community um, and secondary sectors. So it's both the acute trusts, the community trusts and also the CCGs. So they brought together and formed a healthcare collective, 
and then outsource all of their facilities management, which is our core traditional services of cleaning, security, maintenance, and so on. They've also brought in the second component, which is property. Um, if you were redesigning Leicester in terms of uh, clinical services from scratch, you wouldn't have what they currently have. They currently have three acute hospitals in Leicester. Uh, if you speak to most uh, clinicians, they say they probably need one hospital in Leicester. That is not atypical. Most major cities in the UK have got a similar type of issue. So at the moment, Leicester's got around 35% more um, healthcare space than it actually needs. So property rationalisation is a huge part of the Leicester project. And then the third strand to it was transformation. And that's very much how we can impact around the clinical services by delivering better facilities management, but also rationalising that as a state. In effect, we would be a catalyst for change for the organisations. So a huge opportunity. It's worth around potentially up to 700 million over seven years. Um, it's a real Pathfinder project. Um, in terms of our commitments to Leicester, um, really obvious one was um, they currently have about half a million square metres of estate space. And on a pure benchmark, they should be at around 380,000. So over the next seven years, we're going to work with them to rationalise their estate. Uh, it's quite a dramatic reduction. Probably more scary is the fact that only around a third of the estate is actually currently used to deliver clinical care. So in effect, that's only a third of the estate is currently generating revenue for them. So potentially up to 60% of the estate is just not being used for anything that actually generates cash. Um, a benchmark that they should be at is around 60%. So one of the core things for us is the next seven years is to drive up that clinical care efficiency <laughs> by helping them both rationalise the estate, i.e. reduce it, but also make sure that their occupancy is better. <coughs> In terms of standards, the, the key element for us is around two, two parts. One is infection control, which um, we will be responsible for and nutrition, so we're actually going to be feeding the patients um, and that will improve the standards quite dramatically around two key areas where they're, they're benchmarked. And finally, obviously, cost. So we've underwritten 20% saving on their FM services, um, but the bigger prize is actually obviously reducing the estate, which will not only drive down facilities management costs, but also all their ongoing costs in terms of property and back office services. So. Um, Big thing for that is that we have to work together with Leicester. To, we can do, certainly number one is, is in our power, but the other three elements are very much about an integrated approach with the trust. So in terms of the value proposition to them, um, the first important one obviously is the property to reduce the actual ongoing property cost, the direct cost by 20%. However, as we move further from the left to the right, the core thing for us is how we can impact on all of their non-clinical services, saving against the 250 million they currently spend on non-clinical services, so that's your HR, back office, IT, finance, as well as facilities management. And then more importantly, probably, is the one billion pounds they're spending a year in terms of their overall budgets and how we can impact on that. And we think the key thing for that is how we can drive away from delivering services in the acute environment and into the community environment. We can potentially save up to 50% of their actual clinical costs by delivering more care into people's homes or nearer to the point of where they live rather than in the acute environment. Rather than go through all of these different component parts, I just thought I'd highlight two of these in terms of um, key features to our proposal and where we got feedback from the trust that we, we'd actually differentiated ourselves. Um, one is track record. For the NHS to outsource a large project like this, they need to understand that the people they're giving the work to are people who've done this thing before. People who've got a track record of delivering it both in the NHS but also in other sectors, particularly in the public sector. So we had to demonstrate we had a track record and an understanding. And the second really big important thing, I think, is probably about being a local company. So although InterServe is obviously an international company and a national company, the fact that we had a local office, we have local credibility, and our construction colleagues were well known to the trust was really, really important in terms of a confidence factor for them. So just two of the kind of six or seven things that they, they said differentiated us from the competition in terms of this particular project. And... Leicester also gives us growth opportunities. So in itself, it's a great opportunity, but in terms of other things that we can bring, one is it's a framework, so other local NHS customers can buy into that framework. So for, for example, already Nottingham, 30 miles up the road, is buying services from us through the Leicester framework. 
Other government departments in the vicinity can also buy in. So if they're in Leicester, Leicestershire or Rutland, they can buy into the services. So the City Council of Leicester and the County Council are also buying services from us. But probably more strategically important to InterServe is that this model could be translated across to virtually every major town and city in the UK. So Southampton and Leeds are due to come to market shortly and Nottingham is doing its own projects at the moment for which we've just been shortlisted to one of five. So we think this is a transferable capability that could go across the whole of the UK. In terms of clinical services, um, in November we bought Advantage. Advantage is a community care company, so very much in the uh, 15 billion pound market in terms of clinical services, which we see growing. So just to re-emphasize, um, it's a community sector of 15 billion of the 90 billion of clinical services um, currently delivered through the NHS. Um, I put up some of the competitors there. Um, what I think this brings home is that there is no single major player in this sector, it's that 15 billion. And in fact, many of those players are actually only delivering part of that revenue against community services. So it's, um, it's, it's, not a, uh, it's a sector which we think has got loads of potential for someone to, to come along and dominate. In terms of the types of services, I've just listed um, five here. There's around 25 to 30 different services. Um, but these are five which are particularly strong in terms of the capability that Advantage has. Um, as you can see, probably not surprisingly, dementia has been outsourced far more than some of the other um, elements. That's particularly um, because I think the local authority um, social care type services, are there's a big crossover between dementia and the elderly. So, the ageing population in the UK is a huge factor in the, the, the whole dynamics around NHS expenditure. And it, is, it would be unsurprising to see that dementia is a huge component part of that. Um, just to look at the paediatric sector in, in terms of Advantage. <coughs> Advantage currently turns over about 30% of its revenue is actually delivering um, community serv care services into um, paediatric patients, so children. Um, that's a very high percentage um, for any of the um, care providers in the UK. The key thing with um, Advantage, which I think differentiates it from many of its competitors, is that the majority of its staff are actually fully qualified nurses. They're registered general nurses. Um, so their revenue predominantly comes from the NHS. And paediatric care in particular is a huge um, sector in the UK. Uh, very few... Um, services are actually currently provided by the private sector. It's about 95, 95% 90, is still undertaken by the NHS. And although there's 200 um, registered suppliers, most of those actually tend to be individuals or very small companies. There, are, there is no major paediatric care company in the UK in the private sector. So it's, it's, there are barriers to entry, which is the biggest single barrier to entry is actually finding staff. So most of the staff are still employed by the NHS. What Advantage has managed to do is actually recruit um, a, a number of paediatric nurses across the UK and the savings achievable are, are tremendous, up to 35% savings through delivering paediatric care to people's homes rather than the children having to come into hospital, be resident in the hospital to deliver their services. So paediatric care is a, as an exemplar is a, a really positive um, sector for us. And a bit more detail around advantage. In terms of its funding type, Again, I think this is a differentiator for um, Advantage. Nearly over two-thirds of its actual revenue comes from the NHS. So the CCGs, the Clinical Commissioning Groups, now um, basically run by the GPs, uh, they're their primary customer. Um, they do very little work. In fact, it's about 1% of their work is actually through local authorities. So it's much more on the clinical side of services rather than the social care side of services in terms of local authorities, in terms of their funding. And in terms of the actual type of services they're providing, you won't be surprised to see, given that the customer base is the NHS, they tend to be complex care. Complex care means that they're people with <laughs> ongoing care needs, many of them for the rest of their lives, um, many of them with highly clinical requirements, rather than social care type requirements. Um, the personal side of things tends to be for people who are high worth individuals who are buying services on an individual basis. And then just to give you some idea in terms of um, the sort of packages of care, just to give you some idea of what a, a complex care type case might be. So those 50, these are 50 by revenue. Some individuals will have multiple um, conditions across the piece. Um, I would say where, where we think there's a real potential for advantage, which is probably its weakest part at the moment, is in terms of learning and disability, uh, particularly around autism. So though they have a number of cases in this sector, 
it's a, it's, a, it's a rapidly growing sector in terms of requirement, and it's one that's very easily delivered through community services rather than through um, an institutional type approach. And um, we, this is a very uh, simplistic SWOT analysis, but again, it gives you some idea of the types of services that we think Advantage has as a strength, um, looking against its competitors, um, the growth potential, and the, the, the barriers to entry. We, we think it's very important that for us to grow this business, that there needs to be barriers to entry, that you need to have appropriate systems, um, quality management, and procedures to ensure that there's an appropriate means in which the services are delivered. So if you look at the top four or five services there, they're, they're highly visible services in terms of the public perception. Um, they're very important to people's well-being. They're very much more around the, the clinical side of services rather than the um, social care type of services. And then this is um, the branch network which Advantage has. It's across the UK, so there's 27 offices. Um, for a £40 million pound business, that's quite an investment in terms of overhead. Um, that was a real positive when we were looking at um, Advantage in its scalable business. So it has real potential to grow in terms of not only revenue, but in terms of margin. So we think it could, it could certainly double the treble in the next few years in terms of potential with that, the overhead infrastructure that it has. And then... Just to bring together the two components of the clinical services and non-clinical services, um, in terms of Leicester as a, as a singular opportunity, but one which you think could be translated across the UK. So um, at the moment, Leicester, in terms of um, community budget, is spending just around just under two hundred and fifty million pounds a year in terms of community um, services. It's a huge part of its one billion pound overall spend. Um, it's got some very interesting demographics and dynamics, particular to Leicester. Um, one is that it's got very high infant mortality rates relative to um, its uh, other, other cities and below average life expectancy. So it's, it's, not, it's got some real issues. One of its core strategies is to move away from the acute care that it currently has with its three hospitals into far more community-based. And we think through the acquisition of Vantage and the existing project we have at Leicester, we can leverage those two together. So... Just to um, conclude, uh, we think the healthcare outsourcing market for us has got huge potential, both with the FM and the non-clinical community services. Um, we think community and estate management are the fastest developing parts of that, that outsourcing, and that with advantage well-placed in the community sector and the Leicester Pathfinder project, we're very well-placed in this sector 